We now move to the just causes for dismissal. The first is misconduct. Misconduct will constitute a just cause for dismissal if it is serious and work-connected. Serious misconduct but not work-connected will not warrant the penalty of dismissal. On the other hand, work-connected misconduct but not serious will merely warrant a penalty lesser than dismissal. Second is disobedience. Disobedience to employer's orders will constitute a valid cause for dismissal if the disobedience is willful and the order is reasonable, lawful, known to the employee, and work-connected. So disobedience must be willful. Disobedience is willful if it is done intentionally and knowingly, uh, purposely, without valid excuse, as distinguished from an act done carelessly, thoughtlessly or inadvertently. Next is neglect of duty. The neglect of duty must be both gross and habitual. And it is not necessary for the employer to prove damage or prejudice because of the employee's gross and habitual neglect. It is enough that the act tends to damage or prejudice the employer. The employer should not be expected to wait for damage before taking action against the employee. Next is fraud. To constitute a valid cause for dismissal, the fraud must be work-connected and committed against the employer, not against third persons. But even though the law requires that the fraud be committed against the employer, fraud against third persons may still be a valid cause for dismissal if it exposes the employer to the risk of being embroiled in unnecessary lawsuits from such third persons. Next is breach of trust. For breach of trust to constitute a valid cause for dismissal, the employee must hold a position of trust and the breach of trust must be willful and related to the performance of the employee's function. There are two kinds of employees who occupy positions of trust and confidence. First are managerial employees, and second are employees who, in the normal and routine exercise of their function, regularly handle significance of money or property. So the breach must be willful, meaning that it was done intentionally, knowingly, and purposely without justifiable excuse, as distinguished from inadvertence. It is also necessary that the offense must be worked related, that is, related to the duties to which the employee was engaged. Next is commission of a crime. The crime must be committed against the person of the employer, immediate member of the employer's family, or the representative of the employer. The employer could be the owner. The immediate member of the employer's family could be the parents, spouse, children, brother, sister, grandparents or grandchildren, and the authorized representative of the employer who could be the manager or supervisor. Prior conviction is not required. Mere commission of the crime is enough. Then we have analogous causes. To be considered as analogous, the offense must have an element similar to the just causes. Example, theft committed by an employee against a co-employee is analogous to serious misconduct. This is exemplified by the case of John Hancock. In this case, the corporate affairs manager discovered that her wallet containing her credit cards was missing. So she immediately reported the loss of her credit card to the credit card companies. And to her surprise, she was informed that the cards had just been used in several stores in Manila, one of which was Abenson's. Now, the security video from Abenson showed that the person who used the credit cards was her co-employee in the person of the administrative officer. So, because of this, the administrative officer was dismissed. The administrative officer claimed that she cannot be dismissed because the offense of theft was not committed against the company, but against a co-employee. What was the ruling of the Supreme Court? The Supreme Court ruled that although the theft was not committed against the company but against a co-employee, nonetheless, the administrative officer can be validly dismissed because theft committed by an employee against a co-employee is analogous to serious misconduct. Now let's now move to 
sexual harassment. Sexual harassment can be committed under the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act or under the Safe Spaces Act. Sexual harassment under the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act is the act of demanding or requesting sexual favor by a person having authority or moral ascendancy over another, regardless of whether the demand or request is accepted. Casual gestures of uh, friendship and camaraderie during festive or special occasions with other people do not constitute sexual harassment. Under the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act, sexual harassment can be committed only when there is superior subordinate relationship. Sexual harassment under the Safe Spaces Act does not require superior subordinate relationship because sexual harassment under the Safe Spaces Act is gender-based. And gender-based sexual harassment can be committed in workplaces or restaurants, streets, and other public places. Gender-based sexual harassment in the workplace could be unwelcome sexual advances or requests for sexual favors, or uh, it could be unwelcome or unreasonable or offensive conduct of sexual nature, or unwelcome and pervasive conduct that creates an intimidating, hostile, or humiliating environment for the recipient. And these acts may be done verbally, physically, or through technology like email, text, or other forms of information or communication. Employers are required to create a committee on the quorum to investigate and address complaints for sexual harassment. At least one half of the members should be women, and the committee shall be headed by a woman. And the uh, members should come from the management, supervisors, rank and file, and the union if any. So let us now go to the procedure. Procedure for terminating an employee for a just cause. If an employer will be dismissing an employee for a just cause, due process must be observed by first issuing a notice to explain, secondly, conduct a hearing if necessary, and third, issue a notice of decision. The notice to explain should be in writing. Remember, verbal instruction to explain is not considered as substantial compliance with the notice requirement. So, dapat in writing, hindi pwedeng verbal. Also, the notice to explain should specify the acts or omissions committed by the employee. Dapat specific, hindi pwedeng general statement lang. And also, the notice to explain should give the employee reasonable time to explain. What is a reasonable time? According to the case of King of Kings, a minimum of five days is reasonable time. Conference or consultation meetings is not considered as substantial compliance with the notice requirement. Even audit cannot be considered as substantial compliance with the notice uh, requirement. If the continued presence of the employee poses a serious and imminent threat to the life and property of the employer or co-employees, then the employee can be placed under preventive suspension. So what is the legal effect of dismissal without due process? Where the dismissal is adjudged to be valid, lack of statutory due process does not nullify the dismissal or render it illegal, much less ineffectual. The employer is liable only for nominal damages. So, tandaan nyo, ah, the dismissal is adjudged to be valid. In short, dapat mayroong decision finding the dismissal to be valid. If the dismissal is found to be valid, lack of statutory due process will only subject the employer to nominal damages. Eh, paano kung ano, the dismissal uh, was adjudged to be illegal but without due process? What would be the relief? Well, under that situation, the relief is no longer nominal damages but reinstatement with back wages. Kasi the dismissal is found to be illegal. Kaya reinstatement with back wages.